What are you doing? Okay, break before the bend this time. Break! Come on, come on. Ah, oh, I can't do this. This game is too hard. <sighs> What's up? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Look, I'm not going to come into your room. I just found something, and it's yours, so you probably want it or whatever. What is that? I'm just going to put it here and go. Have fun, I guess. Oi, come back here. Oh, I have to reach all the way over there. <sighs> here we go. Hold on. No way. Oh, my goodness. This can't be. It is! It's my DSI! Yes! <laughs> I can't believe it! After all this time, it's finally in my hands! How long has it been? 11 years? Holy hell, this is the best day ever! Jack Six, where'd you find this? Hello? Great, he's gone when I need him. <sighs> Whatever. Oh man, there's so much on my mind, I could talk for a whole series worth of videos on this. Speaking of which... How's about we take a look back at this little known console together? Right, so... Where were we? Let's temporarily put aside me gloating about my long lost DSi and travel back in time to revisit the original Nintendo DS. It released in 2004 in America and 2005 in Australia, making it Nintendo's means of filling the gap between the GameCube and the Wii. I think I got the original DS on my 11th birthday in 2009, and it wasn't anything to scoff at. The DS was fundamentally different from every handheld system that came before it, and with an impressive set of features and an extensive game library, it was a bona fide video game console just like every other home console back then. Hell, it's only the second best-selling console of all time, only below the PlayStation 2. But what do people remember the DS for? Obviously, the double screen of the handheld gave it its name, the lower one being a touchscreen that allowed for interactivity to be built directly into games in a way that no other console has accomplished since. But the DS was much more than just a gimmick. What truly made it a massive hit was its short-range connectivity to other DS consoles. I know it's hard to believe that there was a time when people gathered around and played video games together, but the Nintendo DS made that all the more possible. Because it was a cheap console compared to home systems, more people had one. And because the games were small in size, that naturally brought forth the handheld's biggest innovation in my opinion, DS Download Play. With this handy built-in tool, it was possible to send game data to other DS consoles so you could play multiplayer without everyone owning the game. But those are just the features. When it comes to games, the DS excels even more. Super Mario 64, New Super Mario Bros, Mario Kart, Mario Pi, Party, Nintendogs, Brain Training, Clubhouse Games, tons of Pokemon games, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games, Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Winter Games, and I could keep on listing them. All these great games take full advantage of the DS's double screen touchscreen design, and they are a genuine treat to replay even 18 years after the console was first released. Clearly the Nintendo DS was great, but it's not the main subject of this video, is it? I'm here today to take you on a journey through the world of the DSi. It all started when I got mine on the Christmas day of 2008. I was drawn to the Nintendo DSi because it was, at that time, a modern remake of the original DS with all new features. Naturally, I ditched my dull, clunky silver PDA and made the switch to a less dull and less clunky black one. It also helped that game states are saved on the cartridges and not the system itself, so making the switch was as easy as could be. Now, you might be asking what my thoughts on the 3DS from 2011 are. Well, it was around then that I fell out of the ecosystem and transitioned into PC gaming, so all I can do is ignore its existence, even if it is the better selling of the two. It's likely that this is the case because I lost my DSi that same year. It really has been missing for 11 years, and with that long of a gap since I last touched it, of course I want to share everything I know about it. And anyways, you probably should learn more about the DSi because it's not as well known as the 3DS. Let's begin by first pointing out the obvious differences between the original DS and the DSi. Most important of all is the significant upgrade to the firmware. Just like the Wii, which was two years old by then, the DSi had a menu screen with applications 
applications on it. With this upgrade, you could make use of the two cameras on the inside and outside of the console to take pictures and draw on them, the returning microphone to record and manipulate sounds, and an SD card to store music, photos, and application data. These extra features don't interface with the DS games, instead they were included to market the DSi as a personalizable console, one that each member of a family could own. Since I last touched this in 2011, there are quite a few relics from the past left on here. In the camera application, I have plenty of doctored photos with poor quality drawings all over them. Over in the sounds application, I recorded several hard to listen to sound bites of me and the other kids I hanged around at the time. And in the media player, there's a small collection of music from the 2000s, especially from Bin Air Pilot, who was my favorite artist at the time. But since we're talking about applications, I have to address the DSi Shop. This was the console's own app store, and unfortunately Nintendo shut it down on March 31st, 2017. Huh, would you look at that? Mario died twice. Even without being able to access the shop anymore, I accumulated so much DSiWare to the point where I have no clue how much money I sank into the system. I'm firmly of the belief that the online store and everything you could get from it was the main drawer of the DSi, and the reason anyone would buy the console in the first place. So let's spend some time going through a sampling of the DSi where I collected and review it for your amusement. The one thing I want to get off my chest right away as we start looking through my DSi wear is the art style series. Spanning the DSi and Wii online libraries, this was a large scale experiment by Skip Limited and Cute Games to create a ton of minimalist games that are all easy to learn and hard to master. In order to convince you that these games are amazing, I own five of them on DSi, and I also remember buying art style light tracks for the Wii consoles of my friends on two separate occasions. And yes, I paid for it with my own money because I love that game so much. The ones I own as of now are Box Life, Code, Intersect, Q-Boss, and Pick. And if I reviewed these, I would gush about each of them for far too long. Instead, if you want me to review these games I so clearly adore, let me know in the comments and I'll set myself up to do a separate video for them. One minimalist game I can talk about at length is Reflake Missile, also by Q Games. And honestly, I'm confused why this one isn't part of the art style series as well. This game is like those breakout inspired ball shooting apps you see advertised for mobile devices constantly, but this one has a few clever twists. In each stage, there are a number of blocks you are required to hit, but you only have a certain number of turns. Each turn gives you a predetermined arrangement of missiles, of which there are three types. The blue ones bounce off blocks and die after five hits, the green ones don't bounce but die after seven hits, and the red ones explode on contact. There are 230 levels for this game, excluding the tutorial, and in each you're striving for gold medals that you get by not using all of your turns. These medals are ridiculously hard to achieve sometimes, but it's a level of difficulty I'm all for. It's not just the gameplay that kicks ass though. The soundtrack for the game, even though it's only four tracks long, is seriously some of the best video game music I've ever heard. I'm still floored by how fun this one is to pick up and play. The one thing I won't be doing is attempt to get all of the gold medals, because I can't even finish all the levels within the turn limits. It really is a trial and error affair to get through this game, especially when you have to drag along the screen to aim the missiles. I get it, the touch screen is amazing, but a control scheme where you set the angle with the D-pad and fire with A would have been much easier on everyone. Two DSiWare games that do use this control scheme are Pioro and Paper Plane, remakes of mini games from the Game Boy Advance WarioWare title. These were released for a very cheap price by Nintendo, since it would have been really easy to port these simple games over to the system. This ensured that most people that dabbled with DSiWare would purchase these at some point. In Pioro, you move from side to side and eat the beans that fall from the sky before they destroy the platforms beneath you, and that's pretty much it. Paper Plane has you trying to make it to the bottom of a tower without touching any walls, yet as simple as that sounds, it offers other game modes that make this particular application more replayable. There's a time attack mode where you try to beat your best times for eight pre-made levels, and a race mode where you and a friend battle to reach the bottom on the same console. If there's a downside to both of these games, it's that they have super precise movement. You need to get used to tapping the D-pad quickly, as small directional changes are necessary to get you out of troublesome situations. This is easier said than done when the D-pad you have to work with is tiny. Out of the two games, Paper Plane is clearly better overall by virtue of having more features, but I wanted to include both it and Pioro in this video to show you the full spectrum of what DSiWare was. It encompassed complete games specifically made for the platform like Reflect Missile, retooled game concepts such as these, random free stuff like Clocks for some reason, and for sale demos of traditionally released DS titles. Speaking of demos, here we have Bomberman Blitz, which was just the multiplayer battle mode from Bomberman 2 on the DS. It's obvious now that the DSiWare platform was a way for DS developers to make extra money from their projects, either by creating smaller projects or by splitting their big ones into pieces and reselling them. I don't have a problem with that 
though, especially since I was never interested in or even aware of Bomberman 2 in the early 2010s. A cheap download from the DSi shop was much more convenient than spending the full amount on a cartridge. Anyways, you probably know how Bomberman is played already, but if you don't, it's easy to explain. You blow things up and don't get blown up yourself. What's special about this version of Bomberman is the DS's double screen that makes up one big arena, and you can walk in between the two screens using these tunnels. It's actually quite hard to keep following your character as you move through these tunnels, especially when the pressure blocks start to appear and box you in towards the center of the arena. The battles are customizable though, so you don't have to play with the tunnels if you don't want to. All in all, it's Bomberman, and Bomberman is just as fun as ever. It's a shame that this was Hudson Soft's last Bomberman title, as the company would dissolve later on and had all its properties absorbed into Konami. Oh, quick, let's segue into a less sketchy publisher. Uh, Gameloft. Whew. That was close. So yeah, anybody remember Asphalt? No, not Asphalt 9, I mean Asphalt 4. You know, one of the ancient entries in the series that was still compatible with Nokia phones? Yeah, you'll notice right out of the gate that this piece of DSiWare doesn't have any lighting at all, likely to remain compatible with those phones. But hey, I'm a sucker for arcade style racing games. I already talked at length about why Gran Turismo 3 is so great on my channel, so you can see the kind of person I am to like this as well. Asphalt 4 has you driving on the streets, causing property damage, getting in trouble with the police, likely killing other drivers, and of course, unlocking upgrades for your cars. It's a good combination of the gaminess of old racing games, the wackiness of arcades, and street racing which society is endlessly worried about. Although, coming back to this after 11 years wasn't the greatest experience. I found the controls extremely hard to get used to at first. It felt like I was playing Rad Racer on the NES with how stiff everything felt. After playing for a little longer and buying some upgrades, the controls have gotten a bit better, but the AI difficulty matches the performance of your car, so you don't really feel like you're progressing that much. Disregarding the controls, the game has a mission-based career, but there's very few events, and you're forced to replay them before unlocking others. Even though Asphalt 4 is not a great example of DSiWare, I'll still fall into playing it for several days on end, just like I do with Gran Turismo 3 and 4. But who cares about this random racing game that even I'm not super fond of? You want to see Nintendo characters, you want to see Mario, and maybe Donkey Kong depending on the kind of person you are. Well I have just the game to show you. This is Mario vs. Donkey Kong Minis March again, part of an underrated series tied extensively to Nintendo's handheld consoles. Even the Wii U, which was partially handheld? Despite this being just another DSiWare game at first glance, the Mario vs Donkey Kong series was having difficulty deciding what it should be and how it should control, and it was this game that solidified the gameplay for the rest of the series. It's actually really good, a fleshed out puzzle game where you help automatically moving wind up Marios to get to the goal. The game is always introducing new concepts that significantly significantly change how you approach each level, so it never feels like it's repeating itself. This particular DSiWare actually feels like it could have been a packaged game, put on the shelf alongside Mario vs Donkey Kong 2, which it's apparently based on. Again, I'm glad this appeared on the DSi shop rather than as a cartridge, for I don't think I would have gotten the game if it had released physically. Back then, online games weren't typically competing with the AAA releases that you see in game stores, and that's the bubble I got caught in. A lot of time has passed since the early 2010s, and what was the case then isn't anymore. These kinds of games, concepts, and demos would now have to compete with the big names of today, and they wouldn't be nearly as successful. It's hardly acceptable to resell part of an existing game as a new and cheaper alternative product now. And I know it sounds crazy, but I miss those times. Nintendo and all the other developers were actively experimenting on games for the DSi Shop and the Wii Shop channel, and because of that, we got the chance to play some really impressive stuff that wouldn't have seen the light of day in present time. Ever heard of the BitTrip series? That got its footing because of this era of experimentation. We really did lose a fair bit of gaming history when these shops shut down, and also when the plug was pulled on Nintendo Wi-Fi connection in 2014. But the one thing Nintendo can't take away from us are the games and the systems we've already collected. Even though it was lost for 11 years, I have my DSi once again, and so I can continue to experience this nostalgia of mine anytime I want. And it is for those reasons, no matter how selfish they are, that the Nintendo DSi is a forgotten masterpiece. Wow, I got carried away there. We're not done. That's not the end of the video. I've still got one more application to show you. It's a free animation software that doubled as a gateway to a social network full of other animators. Just another example of Nintendo's rampant experimentation. It was called Flipnote Studio and... That's strange. I feel... nervous. Why do I feel nervous? What about this app is scaring me? Animation software. My old animations. Oh, no, this feeling makes no sense. You're 24 years old. You're not in Cringetown anymore. 
I'm just going to open it, have a look, and not acknowledge it from then on. It can't be that bad. Oh no. This, this is bad. This is even worse than I thought. Don't tell me that I... I did. I made a Sonic OC. Ah! Ah! Why did I make that? No wonder I lost my DSi. Oh, my eyes! My adult eyes! This video is dedicated to Jerry Lexington non actual name, Alexa, and Snartle for funding this channel. Become a patron today if you want to see my terrible animations with audio before they're released to the public.